In 2019, we'll be making a series of documentaries asking how we can rebuild the public transport system in this country so that it becomes democratic, accountable, and most importantly, meets the needs of the people who use it. It's time to give passengers and activists centre stage and let them challenge politicians and transport companies to get involved in the conversation. We're starting with a trip to Manchester, where bus campaigners tell us there's a big opportunity to bring their city's buses back under public control after 30 years of privatisation. And we'll be hearing a range of views on the new legislation that's enabled this, including an interview with the MP Daniel Zeichner, who helped get it through Parliament back in 2017. My name is Pascal Robinson, I'm part of the Better Buses for Greater Manchester campaign. I'm Tom Haynes Doran, I'm a transport researcher and activist and we're here in Levensham in South Manchester. I'm Ellie Harrison from Get Glasgow Moving, we were founded in 2016. I'm Daniel Zeichner and for two years in Parliament I was Labour's Shadow Buses Minister. I'm now a member of the Transport Select Committee. The privatisation of buses in the mid-80s was supposed to drive down fares and improve services by encouraging competition. Instead, bus ridership has nosedived and we've ended up with a series of market monopolies across the UK, where 70% of the market is owned by the big five. That's Arriva, First, Go Ahead, Stagecoach and National Express. In metropolitan areas over the last 10 years, an estimated 85% of bus company profit has been leakage to shareholders, which suggests that only 15% has gone back into the local economy. And over the same period, we've seen government cuts to supported services in England and Wales by up to 45%, with well over 3,000 routes cut nationwide since 2010. Things are now so bad that the UK's deregulated bus market was directly called out in the UN report on poverty last year, which recommended that transport should be an essential service and stated that abandoning people to the private market is incompatible with human rights requirements. Our fares have gone up 55% in the last 10 years and that's just a ridiculous state of affairs when people are taking home millions of profit every year. No other countries around the world run their public transport in this way. It's absurd and the worst thing about it is it's a total waste of money. It's a combination of austerity and the amount of money that they have to pay in subsidy to the private bus companies in order to run the services. That means that there's huge amounts of cuts. London is the only city that remained regulated when the bus market was privatised in the mid-1980s and this is the reason it has multi-modal ticketing. And as for fares, in London you can take an hour-long journey for £1.50, whereas a single journey in Manchester can cost £4 and customers have to buy a new ticket if they switch to a different company's buses. If you get a day ride or one, you can't use it on another state, bus company. You know, it costs them an hour, right? For example, in London, if you have Oyster Car, you can get like the buses, the underground, everything. But here, for example, the tram, you have to have a ticket. For the bus, you have to have another ticket. And for the other companies, you have to have different tickets. So you end up with like £10 a day. So right now, there are at least 18 bus companies running different services across Greater Manchester. And that means that we have a really confusing, fragmented, but still somehow skeletal network. The system that we have is discoordinated, it's expensive, uh, the buses are old and polluting. Uh, and it's not a system that encourages people to use public transport, which is really important here in Manchester, given that we have huge traffic problems and huge, a huge health crisis caused by uh, emissions. The way it works at the moment is that bus companies only run the routes that they want to and then they're given public money to run extra routes, socially necessary routes that we all desperately need. So what we're talking about here is not the most uh, profitable uh, routes. For example, the Oxford Road corridor, which has lots of students with lots of demand for travel. We're talking about the areas of Manchester that are often the poorest, Whereas I say, people don't necessarily even have access to a car. There's kind of a hole here in this part of Manchester where there's a lot of places to get to. You have to actually go into town to go out of town again. So it becomes really quite an arduous journey to get somewhere that's actually quite close to you. And it can take you two hours to get there. And that is quite hard. <laughs> It should be easier and more accessible for everybody because I know some of my friends tend to work 
Anywhere at work at like 6 a.m. Yep. They have to get up at like 3, and then That's they have to get crazy. yeah, then they have to get two buses. But yeah. on certain days they have to get even earlier because they have to get certain like different buses and they have to walk. And then, and I just think the times should be the same like daily. 37% of job seekers in Greater Manchester say that transport is a barrier to accessing work. We're literally holding people back with our transport system at the moment. Manchester's been um, wanting to have a, um, some, a more coherent system because the problem with privatisation has always been fragmentation and duplication of services on the, on the key routes and a lack of ability to actually um, spread the benefits. So what we've seen in many places is of course, and if, if it is a profit seeking system, it's perfectly understandable. You don't run the early morning services, the late night services, the Sunday services, which are essential for people. But in terms of profit, they make less sense. But we need a service. Fundamentally, I think it's important to step back and ask how this network has grown, if you can even call it a network, because bus companies don't sit down and ask, how can we get people where they want to go? They don't ask that question. They ask, how can I make money in this system? How can I make money from the people living here? And the network is built up from decisions like that rather than trying to run a network in a proper way. Bus companies therefore just run the profitable routes, routes where demand is high enough for operators to make a profit. And once they've cherry picked these routes, everything else becomes less viable. And other services can only be provided through public funding at a disproportionate cost. What it means is that there's vast areas of Greater Manchester that are ha becoming like rural areas in terms of their transport provision. They're becoming cut off from the rest of Manchester, where all the jobs are in the city centre. Uh, we live in a city that's becoming ever more centralised in terms of jobs uh, and in terms of transport. And it's really, we're, ha we're seeing, along with all the other austerity cuts, uh, transport leaving people isolated and leaving people uh, behind. So the opportunity that we have right now is really crucial. The legislation was passed last year which allows local authorities with an elected mayor to bring their buses into public control and that's why everyone is looking to see what happens in Greater Manchester, um, Cambridgeshire, Bristol. There's so many opportunities right now because people are really angry about how bad their buses have got. Under the 2017 Bus Services Act, combined authorities with an elected mayor now have the right to implement London-style bus regulation. This makes it one of the strongest powers these mayors now hold. The mayoral areas that now have bus franchising powers are Greater Manchester, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, the West Midlands, the West of England, the Liverpool City region and the Tees Valley. To find out more about this new legislation, we spoke to the MP Daniel Zeichner, who was Labour's Shadow Boss Minister at the time of the Boss Services Act and is now a member of the Transport Select Committee. Well, it, it not only introduces franchising, it also introduces a range of other partnership arrangements. And there is some evidence that in some areas where there are good relationships, the West Midlands is often cited as one, where actually a, a good relationship between local authorities and bus operators has produced some good results. And we've seen that also, the, the Transport Select Committee has been looking at, at some of these, some down the south coast in Brighton. So it can be achieved within the current systems, but it's, it, it's the exception rather than the rule as far as we can make out. Um, and that's probably partly, I would say, because local authorities, particularly transport authorities, which in rural areas are often the counties, are so completely um, transfixed by having to cut budgets at the moment. Um, you know, you can't take 40% out of your local government funding, as the government's done, and expect there to be no consequences. So I don't think many of them have got the capacity at the moment to even use the opportunities that are there already, even assuming that there's goodwill from the operator. In some cases, the operators are actually quite happy with the situation. They're making quite a lot of money. Andy Burnham has the decision in the next year to uh, bring buses into public control. The local authority would run them the same way London does, and it would mean that you have one simple smart ticket card with an automatic daily cap on your spend. The system would be simple, easy to understand, all in one place. Uh, information wise and affordable fares it will set a precedent for sure because it's quite a difficult process to go through the legislation doesn't make it easy it will show to the rest of the UK how great it is when you re-regulate buses. So crucially for um, our air quality and for climate change we could improve the standards of the vehicles themselves. 
because regulation um, could actually help shape um, what sort of buses we have, so low emission and zero <coughs> emission buses such as hybrid, um, biogas or um, electric. So ultimately, as we've, we've heard from um, everyone, the decisions about where and when and how we run our bus services need to be about meeting social and environmental need. It's not about the profitability of um, bus corporations. The pressure is clearly growing on Andy Burnham to be the first mayor to make use of the new powers in the Bus Services Act and he's already said publicly that he's seeking a London-style system for Manchester. Over the past year, the issue of bus regulation has hit the headlines on a regular basis and recent polling commissioned by Better Buses for Greater Manchester suggests that 76% of people are in favour of the move. The Greater Manchester Combined Authority is expected to run a public consultation later this year and bus companies have already responded by putting an alternative offer on the table. The newly launched One Bus represents 18 commercial bus operators and has just proposed a £100 million partnership blueprint for Greater Manchester, which it says could address issues like congestion at no cost to the taxpayer. Partnerships are being offered as this shiny prize and the reality is that they maintain the status quo that we've got already. They're voluntary agreements, uh, meaning the bus companies have to kind of offer up what they want to give and that to me, it just shows how unappealing they are. They will only offer what they want to offer and we know that private companies don't volunteer to offer fantastic systems where they make no money. For a system that works for passengers and staff and not shareholders, I think we need to be able to hold them to account and that's why we need a regulated, publicly controlled bus network. So there are different proposals. There's are proposals from the private bus companies like Stagecoach, which are basically saying, trust us, we'll make things better. But they've been saying that for a long time, things have got a lot worse. We can have a system with simple area-wide fares, valid across all forms of local public transport, and a pay-as-you-go smart ticketing with caps and the automatic best deal. And there's a few things in that, but you can't do this now in Greater Manchester and you still can't do it under partnership. There's a reason for that, it's against competition law, it's just not allowed. So no matter what it looks like, the offer that's on the table, there's always something missing, it's usually in the small print. And you either have a regulated bus market or you don't, and you can't have the ticketing and fare system that we want without regulation. So the only way to have that London style ticketing is with London style regulation. We're going to have a fight on our hands to actually get the transport authorities to implement it because they're all terrified of the bus companies. The only time that franchising has been tested outside of London is in the North East when the bus companies threatened to sue the transport authority. And so we really need passengers to get together and to fight back against the private bus companies. It's clear that campaigners are expecting a fight over regulation and nearly everyone we spoke to brought up the story of what happened in 2015 in Tynan Weir when bus companies opposed an attempt by the combined authority to regulate under the previous much weaker legislation. One of the reasons it was rejected by an independent review board was for having disproportionate adverse effects on bus operators, despite the board also recognising that the proposal would have generated £130 million in benefits to the local economy. Well, it was a, it was a long battle and basically um, under the legislation the Labour governments had introduced, it was possible to effectively re-regulate your local buses through um, a system called a quality contract. But no one has ever actually managed to achieve a quality contract because the bus operators basically challenged through a legal process. And this is a complex interaction with competition law. So kind of, I think, the conclusion people came to after a long and really bitter and expensive dispute was it was too difficult to do, which is why um, the Conservative government, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, brought the Bus Services Act forward. Less surprisingly, as, as Labour's spokesperson at the time, I was very keen to support it because we'd seen what had happened in Newcastle and we wanted to make it easier for local authorities and local people to get that control over their local services. The fact it's taken two years since the legislation and we still haven't got to the first one suggests it's still not an easy process. So 
the Bus Services Act obviously presents a new opportunity, but is even this legislation strong enough or will combined authorities have a fight on their hands to get their buses back under public control? The Buses Act, in my view, is a very poor piece of legislation. It's not making it very easy for us or for Transport for Greater Manchester or the Mayor. Too many hoops, there's too many codified legalese, there's too much accountability things, assessments they require. It's going to be tortuous and it's going to be expensive for us as council taxpayers in this great city region to make sure this goes through. But we need to stay with this tortuous process because it's the th if we don't sit through it, we're going to get people saying, oh no, it's going to cost too much, oh, oh there's legal stuff. We're going to have to fight that battle and stick with it all the way through. A recent report by Transport for Quality of Life show that the regulation of Britain's buses would lead to net financial gains of around £340 million per year. That would be enough to restore all the cuts to supported bus services since 2010. So if bus regulation could reverse a whole decade of cuts, it's really hard to understand why, in the two years since the Bus Services Act, we haven't seen any mayor use these powers. If Andy Burnham goes ahead, he will be the first, and this could give confidence to other local authorities. We're tired of the slow rate of change across privatised transport, so it's up to us to have the conversation. We're now collaborating with passenger groups all over the country, and it's time to bring the debate into every public meeting. We'll also be inviting transport companies to participate in interviews and events. The question is, Will they join the regulation debate face to face with the people who rely on their services? Over the last few years we've seen passenger groups popping up all around the UK. People are starting to realise how private bus companies are ruining our public transport network. We're starting a national conversation. We want properly regulated public transport networks and we need to start talking about how we're going to fund it. How are we going to get the money? Businesses that benefit from a public transport network need to be contributing and we need to be building a world-class public transport network for everybody in this country. I mean, we know London's bus network is amazing, but it's not just London that deserves a good bus network. Everywhere across the country deserves decent buses and we just don't have that right now. It's imperfect, but regulation of the franchise starts a journey where we will get more public rights and control. What I'm saying then, folks, and sitting at the core of this argument is the need for citizens to have a public right to decent and affordable public transport and clear democratic oversight, control and power over that. Bus franchising is the regulation is the best we can get. Let's go for it. Let's give support to our Mayor in Greater Manchester and let's get better buses for Greater Manchester. Thank you.